Hey, welcome back. Mr. P here. This is the second lecture of chapter 11, and in this lecture we're going to talk specifically about Mendelian genetics. Um, if you're following along in your textbook, you'll notice that Mendelian genetics is actually the first section of chapter 11, and meiosis is actually the fourth section. Uh, but I decided to move meiosis to the front because there's a natural progression in my mind between mitosis, which is where we ended in last uh, last semester's content and meiosis which is where we started in uh, this year's content so if we talk a little bit about mitosis or review a little bit about mitosis remember that mitosis is a process in which cells like skin cells and body cells and those things that we call somatic cells divide in order to ensure genetic continuity and what I mean by that is body cells make more body cells, your skin cells make more skin cells, your brain cells make more brain cells, nerve cells make more nerve cells, and so on. Okay, it's important for you as an organism to maintain uh, a similar number and a similar type of cell for a particular tissue. Um, and mitosis is good at, at ensuring that genetic continuity. Meiosis, on the other hand, is when a diploid cell becomes four haploid cells and uh, over the course of the last week and a half we've been talking in depth about meiosis in class and remember that there are several things that kind of differ between Mendelian uh, or between meiosis and mitosis remember in mitosis there is one round of PMAT and meiosis there are two mitosis uh, takes one diploid cell and produces two diploid cells in humans case that's a cell with 46 chromosomes becoming two cells with 46 chromosomes Mitosis ensures genetic continuity, whereas meiosis is going to ensure genetic, ensure genetic variation uh, because they're taking or we're taking one diploid cell and we're producing four haploid gametes or haploid sex cells, the gametes being sperm cells and egg cells. Okay, um, there's also one other big difference uh, between mitosis and meiosis. Meiosis, uh, there is a thing called synapsis, which is a process that takes chromosomes, homologous chromosomes, and lines them up uh, in tetrads. And tetrads is kind of a fancy way of saying a structure that contains four chromatids. And you know by your uh, in-depth study or in-depth uh, understanding of chromosomes that two chromatids make up an X-shaped chromosome. And so a tetrad would be uh, two X-shaped chromosomes uh, resulting in four chromatids which is also a homologous pair. So let's get into a little bit about Mendelian genetics. Mendel is, uh, is said to be the father of genetics and we'll learn in several slides uh, why, but um, he was the first one that really kind of took it upon himself to try to articulate and try to predict certain, um, certain modes of inheritance and certain um, potential or certain outcomes of genetic crosses. Uh, before Mendel's time, uh, it was very likely that people thought that improvements made to one person were passed on to their offspring. Uh, for instance, bodybuilders or people that were incredibly strong would have strong children. Okay, Or dyeing your hair red or green or purple uh, would give rise to red haired children or green haired children or purple haired children um, that getting a tattoo on oneself would result in a tattooed baby or um, losing a limb, losing a leg, losing a hand, losing an arm, losing a finger would give rise to a child that is missing that appendage and we know now that that is not correct. In fact, um, after Mendelian's time uh, or after Mendel's time, there were several experiments that uh, played into this or tried to prove that this was correct uh, and they would cut tails off rats and uh, after several generations or even after one generation they found that tailless rats gave rise to rats with tails uh, and <clears throat> that's easy for us to believe now because improvements made to yourself isn't going to be passed down okay what is going to be passed down is genes uh, within our DNA Okay, our DNA contains genes, and within those genes, we contain alleles, which are alternative forms of a gene, and those alleles are going to give rise to specific proteins, which are going to give rise to a specific phenotype, which is going to give rise to specific traits. So a little bit about Gregor Mendel. He was an Austrian monk and, um, and, and really wasn't a monk based on any religion, but was a monk uh, 
because he wanted to or was in pursuit of an education. And at that time, it was fairly common practice to join a monastery so that you could uh, spend all your time or devote your time to the pursuit of knowledge. He really wanted to uh, become a, a teacher, and specifically a math teacher, but uh, he kind of had to study on his own because a lot of the teachers at the time um, really questioned his math skills and said that his math wasn't strong enough, and, um, and it's kind of ironic, uh, as you'll find out, that the thing that he's really known for is determining uh, ratios and determining probabilities of uh, expressed traits which is all math. And so um, while certain individuals in his life said that his math wasn't uh, good enough or wasn't strong enough, he kind of proved them wrong and basically became known for um, his math. But anyway, because of his naturalist mentality uh, and his love for the outdoors and his love for plants and his love for nature, he quickly noticed while he was in, a gar in his garden that uh, pea plants often exhibited one uh, dominant factor or one dominant trait, but there were also other factors that happened in less frequency, okay, or in smaller concentrations. And we'll find out that there were certain factors, okay, he called them factors. We know them today as alleles. Uh, these alleles are alternative forms of genes. And so he said there are pea plants that are or express purple flowers, and there are pea plants that express white flowers, and there are pea plants that express. Um, axial uh, flower position or terminal uh, flower position or um, restricted pod shape or round pod shape or round seed or wrinkled seed or tall plant or uh, short plant okay and so there's all these different factors in it and it really kind of um, made him curious about what it was that these plants possessed in order to determine what they're ultimately going to look like and could he use math in order to determine the specific ratios or the expected or predicted outcomes? And it turns out that if you cross specific factors or specific plants, you can predict the outcomes, uh, which is kind of what his work is based on, and, uh, and therefore he became the father of genetics. So he raised these pea plants, and uh, before we understand kind of what the genetics are for these pea plants, it's important for you to know a little bit about the plant anatomy. And so, why peas? <clears throat> why would he spend all of his time uh, looking at specific traits or specific outcomes of pea plants? And, um, and all of these things are really important for peas. They grow fast. They reproduce fast. They have numerous offspring. Their traits are easily seen. Okay? It doesn't take a genius to look at a, pl a flower and determine if it's purple or white. It doesn't take a genius to determine if a plant is tall or short. It doesn't take a genius in order to determine if the pod is wrinkled or if it's smooth. Okay, and so it, it allows an individual like Mendel, who didn't have a very strong biological or mathematical background, uh, it allowed him an easier time to determine what these traits are. And they're easy to manipulate for breeding. Okay, and so a little bit about plant anatomy. All flowers, okay, or the flower of a plant, the flower of the plant is in charge of or um, is for reproductive purposes. The flower's petals, which are usually bright colored, are there only to attract pollinators. And uh, those pollinators can be mammals, they can be birds, they can be insects, uh, they can be a lot of things. And uh, these flower petals are there in order to attract pollinators. And within the plant, uh, flower are the female and male reproductive systems. The female system is this large ovary connected to the carpal, okay, and the carpal includes the ovary and uh, the style and stigma, okay. The stigma is the opening of this plant uh, female reproductive system, okay, stigma, and then the style which leads, it's a tube that leads down to the ovary where the ovule is kept. And so the stigma style ovary. Down here is where the egg of this plant sits. And the sperm cells, or the pollen, are found on the ends of the stamens. Okay, the stamen is the male portion of the plant. And um, all the pollen is kept right here on the ends called the anther. And the anther is kept up or held up by these long filaments or long stalks 
And it's important that the plant keeps the male sperm cells or the pollen up uh, towards the opening of the stigma because as a, as a bee or as an insect, butterfly, moth, whatever, as the insect brushes past the anthers, it's going to deposit pollen from these anthers into the stigma. It's going to run down the style and then ultimately uh, fertilize the ovule that's down here and that plant has just been uh, fertilized, okay? Or that plant has just reproduced. Now, it's just as common for insects and birds and mammals to rub past the anthers of this particular flower, fly to the next flower, and deposit the pollen from this flower, flower number one, to the stigma of the flower number two, okay? So that's how a plant reproduces kind of sexually, meaning one plant can reproduce with another plant by uh, the de deposition or depositing pollen via insect or wind from this plant to this plant, okay? Now, it's important for you to know that the plant reproduces this way, okay? The pollen has to leave the filament or leave the anther, the stamen, and deposit itself in the stigma style and ultimately end up at the ovule within the ovary, okay? So, Gregor Mendel would actually take um, let's just go back, okay? Now, if we talk about how Gregor Mendel actually manipulated these plants, he would remove the stamens. Remember, the stamens are the male portion of the plant. Um, they hold up, or they include the, um, the filament and the anther, okay? So he removed the male portion of the plant. He kept the male portion of the plant, which included all the pollen in a bag, away from all the other plants, he then, when it was time to crossbreed or cross-pollinate these plants, he would take a paintbrush and he would paint the pollen from plant one on the female portion of plant two. Okay, and this allowed him to control his crosses. He was able to control his crosses by only painting the pollen from one plant on the specific plant of his choice. Okay, and so he was able to cross uh, individual lines uh, or plant lines that way. So if we go back to the actual uh, traits, okay, pure breeding traits, homozygous. Homozygous is a fancy genetic term that means same traits, okay, uh, or same alleles. And uh, some these are those easy to observe uh, phenotypes or easy to observe shapes uh, or colors or lengths or heights or that kind of thing. And so he looked at peas that had purple flowers and white flowers axial versus terminal flower position, yellow versus green seed color, round versus wrinkled seed shape, inflated versus constricted pod shape, which are the, th the structures that the peas are actually in, green versus yellow pod color, and tall versus dwarf or short stem length. Okay, He often took purple plants and crossed them with white plants, or green peed plants and crossed them with yellow peed plants and inflated pod-shaped plants and cross them with constricted pod-shaped plants. And you'll actually see later on in the chapter that um, he didn't always just do monohybrid crosses, meaning he didn't just do purple versus white. He actually did purple and yellow seed color, purple flower, yellow seed color, versus white or crossed with white green. That's what we call a dihybrid color or a dihybrid cross, uh, and we'll talk about that in detail. But Let's talk a little bit about his experimentation or the experiments that really led his uh, led to his big discovery and that, that you can or it is possible to predict uh, offspring of a particular cross. So in this case, he took a purple flowered pea plant and he crossed it with a white flowered pea plant. The most important part uh, of this first P1, which stands for parental one or first parental generation, okay, parental cross, the parental generation is always assumed to be true breeding, okay? And what that true breeding means is that those flowers or those organisms can only uh, pass on one particular allele, okay? And I'll use the big A allele for purple and the little a allele for white, okay? So if this flower is true breeding for purple, we know that it has only the big A alleles and if this flower, okay, let's just assume this is the female flower, and this is the male flower, okay, and we cross this male with this female, the male is homozygous dominant, 
and the female is homozygous recessive. The offspring, F1, which stands for first filial, okay, first filial is the first offspring generation, is going to get a big A from dad and a little a from mom because that's the only thing she can give and that's the only thing he can give and you get 100 percent heterozygous flowers which means big a little a now 100 percent of the purple uh, or 100 percent of the plants are purple why because 100 percent of the plants contain at least one big a in this case 100 percent of the plants contain big a little a okay so all the plants are purple but what do the plants, uh, what are the plants carrying? The plants are carrying a recessive allele here, and because they're carrying a recessive allele, which just happens to be masked by this dominant allele, um, they have the potential of expressing that little a allele if it mixes with another little a allele. Okay, and so we're going to go into uh, this next cross which is um, going to give rise to our F2 generation. F2 generation, second filial or second offspring generation. Now, he crossed these purebred or true breeding parents, which gave us 100% heterozygous offsprings. When he crossed the heterozygous offsprings with himself, meaning he took one heterozygous male and he crossed it with a heterozygous female, which, for lack of better terms, crossed a... Uh, brother with sister. Now, it's not as weird when you're talking about pea plants as it is humans, so uh, bear with me. But they're brothers and sisters because they're all of the same generation. He crossed a male and female, uh, both heterozygous, and you get half the time a big A and half the time a little a from this individual, half the time a big A from that individual, and half the time a little a individual, okay, or little a from that individual. And then you just kind of add those up, right? So this one can definitely meet with this one, or mix with that one, or it can mix with that one. This one can mix with that one, or mix with that one. Okay, it's just like distribution in math. So we get a big A, big A. We get two big A, little A's. And we get a little A, little A. Now... These three here are purple. So you notice three-fourths of the plants have purple flowers. This one is white. So one-fourth of the plants have white flowers. Okay, That is our Mendelian monohybrid cross three-to-one ratio, which is going to come up all the time. So now that we have that three-to-one ratio figured out, uh, we'll talk a little bit about these factors and how they're segregated. Remember, he called them factors, we call them alleles today. That would be the things like uh, purple flower color or white flower color or uh, constricted pod shape or round pod shape, that kind of thing. The white trait disappeared in the F1, remember, because it was masked by the dominant A. Okay, So we're saying the white allele, white trait, which is the little A, was masked by the big A or purple allele, so it disappeared, but the white trait reappeared in the F2 because when you cross two heterozygous individuals that both have a little a, um, one-fourth of the time those little a's are going to meet and produce a white individual. Okay, This rule or follows the rules of probability and everybody knows what the rule of probability is because I think everybody has uh, at some point in their life ruled a die or pulled a card out of a deck or flip a coin. And so let's just talk about the rules of probability as it relates to flipping a coin because I think it's easy to understand. The rule of multiplication or the rule of probability states that we can combine or we can find a combined effect of two events that are independent of one another by timesing them together, okay, or multiplying them together. If we flip a coin, half of the time we're going to get a heads theoretically and half the time we're going to get a tails theoretically. So the question is, what is the probability of two coins flipped simultaneously coming up heads? The two coins are completely independent of each other, which means if I flip one, it doesn't dictate the other one's outcome. And so we say there's a half chance we're going to get a head 
on this coin and there's a half chance we're going to get ahead on this coin and so what is the combined effect half times a half gives us a fourth um, a fourth chance we will get two heads when we flip two coins and it's easy to understand because um, what are the two options uh, or four options I should say we're either going to get a heads heads or we're going to get a heads tails or we're going to get a tails heads or we're going to get a tails tails what is the probability that we get two heads one out of four or one-fourth what is the likelihood or probability of getting two tails one-fourth okay what is the probability of getting one tails and one heads you would say one half because you could get it this way or this way two-fourths simplified would be one half each coin is independent of each other that's really important and it's just like that in genetics because each allele is completely independent of each other plant height is independent of flower color which is independent of flower position which is independent of seed shape which is independent of seed color okay so let's talk a little bit about if we go back to this example and we talk about it in terms of probability this purple flower like I said before is big A big A this white flower is little a little a what is the likelihood that this purple flower will give a big A to this offspring well you would say it's one out of one because there is one 100 percent really that you're gonna give a big A to that plant and then over here you get it's a 100 percent chance you're gonna give a little a to this plant because it's hundred percent you don't have any other options when you times 100 by 100 you get one out of one or 100 percent big a little a 100 percent now this is where it gets a little different this is big a little a heterozygous when we cross a heterozygous individual with a heterozygous individual what is the likelihood that this plant uh, or this individual let's just say this is the male and this is the female what is the likelihood that the male will give a big A allele? Well, there's two options, either a big A or a little a. And so what is the option or what is the probability of giving a big A? You would say one out of two big A. And it's a one out of two. It's going to give you a little a. What is the likelihood that this individual will give you a big A? Well, it's the same thing. One half big A and there's a one half chance you'll get a little a so what's the likelihood that the two big a's will combine one half times one half gives us one fourth big a big a what is the likelihood that which is basically saying we're distributing there what's the likelihood of getting a big a little a we're distributing here you would say it's one fourth big a little a what is the likelihood that we get a little a and a big a one fourth because one half times one half big a little a now I know it's little a big a but we always write the big first because it's dominant to the little a and the last one we distribute would be here and here and so one half times one half gives us one fourth what is the likelihood we get little a little a one fourth little a little a now what's unique about these three they all have at least one big A which means they all have purple flower color this one because it has little a little a it is one fourth um, white flowers okay so let's talk a little bit about um, some vocabulary okay vocabulary allele is an alternative form of a gene we've talked about it numerous times homozygous homo is a prefix meaning same so it's having two of the same type of alleles like big a big a or little a little a heterozygous hetero is a prefix meaning different so having two different alleles that would be things like big a oh, big a little a genotype is the genetic makeup of an organism so what the actual genes look like like big a little a big b 
little b would be a genotype. Phenotype is the outward or physical appearance of the gene. So what these genes actually say. Big A meaning it's purple. Big B maybe meaning it's wrinkled. Okay, or big B meaning it's tall, etc. Okay. Allele, homozygous, heterozygous, genotype, phenotype. Um, I think that's where we'll leave it. Uh, until next time, see ya.